If not so much, we'll revisit your teetering, Cowboys teetering a little later in the show. But I'm happy for that entire fan base, the 12s mm. and for the Seahawks to get Cam Chancellor back. Breaking news also in Cleveland. After Johnny Manziel led the team to victory on Sunday over the Titans, starting for Josh McCown, who was sidelined due to concussion that he suffered in week one, there were question marks as to who would start moving forward. Well, McCown has been cleared to play, and this just in, he's going to start on Sunday when the Browns host the Raiders. Skip, what does this mean for Johnny now moving forward? Molly, Stephen A., here's my position. If the current head coach, Mike Pettin, and the current GM, Ray Farmer, and the current quarterback coach, John DeFilippo. Flip. Flip. I call him Flip. Mm -hmm. If they had pushed on draft night to draft Johnny Manziel, which none of them obviously did. Right. Johnny would be starting on Sunday because they would be doing everything in their power to prop him up and make him a success in Cleveland, Ohio. But they're going back to Josh McCown because they all fear for their jobs. Mm -hmm. They're all teetering. This could be the last year of yet another regime in Cleveland, Ohio. This one, the Mike Patton regime. I'm not a big fan of Mike Patton as a head football coach. I'm not sure about Ray Farmer. I have no idea how John DeFilippo got this job mm -hmm. with, with no resume, no credentials. First time offensive coordinator in the National Football League. And I feel sorry for Johnny that he's stuck in this situation. And I'm hoping against hope that somehow he can find his way out of Cleveland and into a fresh start, as, albeit somebody's backup quarterback somewhere else. Dallas, Texas, maybe at some point. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But look, with Johnny Manziel, you either gulp the Kool-Aid or you spit it out. You love him or you despise everything that he is. And I thought it was telling, even though it was an amusing anecdote, I think I read it wherever it was, USA Today. Mm -hmm. Molly and I talked about it before the show. When Johnny made his very extemporaneous scramble out of the pocket oh, outside yeah. of Arakpo, mm -hmm. ran to his left, threw across his body, Travis Benjamin hit him right in stride for the, the second and clinching touchdown in the game last Sunday. Mm -hmm. DeFilippo said into his headset very quietly with no emotion, coaching's overrated. <laughs> Well, you, you can laugh at that because sometimes coaching is overrated when it comes to Johnny Manziel. But coaches do not want to be overrated, and these coaches want to maintain control of their offense. And it's hard to control what Johnny does and doesn't do because Johnny's going to do whatever he feels like will work at that moment. Mm -hmm. Cliff Kingsbury, now the head coach at Texas Tech, used to tell me that when he was the coordinator at A&M, Johnny would come to the sideline, as he's winning a Heisman Trophy, and say, Coach, I'm sorry, I apologize. And, and Kingsbury would say, you never have to apologize for scoring a touchdown. Well, it's the same with these guys, except you do have to apologize to this staff because they don't like you scoring a touchdown even that way. Mm -hmm. And I look at the skill players, I put quotes around skill players, mm -hmm. around Johnny Manziel, it's pathetic. It's the worst in the National Football League. I'm looking at Isaiah Crowell as their leading rusher. He was undrafted. Travis Benjamin's the leading, he's the only threat they have on offense. Mm -hmm. He was a fourth round pick. Mm -hmm. The, the second, well. yeah, he has played very well because he can fly. But mm -hmm. Andre Hawkins, he was undrafted. Mm -hmm. Gary Barnage is a tight end, was a yep. fifth round pick of Carolina. Are you, this is it. This is what you're working with. The offensive line outside of the left tackle is very good, is below average. They have a hard time protecting anybody, including Josh McCown or Johnny Manziel. So this is what you're stuck with. It, it was, Amazing that Johnny won the game the other day. I know he hit only 9 out of 18 passes, but the two big touchdowns. And they were fortunate they were playing against a Marcus Mariota who was flat out overmatched even against Patton's defense, which had figured out that all he does is pick and pop, dink and dunk. And if you'll take away the first quick read, you'll make him struggle. And they hit him and they knocked him around. And you made the point he got dinged early in the game and he was never the same. Mm -hmm. But my point is... This is what Johnny is stuck with. So in a way, I'm relieved for him not having to start for this team. But again, if he had a support system around him, an organization that believed in him, he, he'd be the starting quarterback and they would be doing everything in their power to 
to tailor the offense to make him the success that I know he can be in the well, National Football Well, I think a legitimate league. argument can be made that you are being unfair to the Cleveland Browns organization. But I will say that to you in fairness to you and your football expertise because what I'm about to point out is something Merrill Hodge told me as opposed to me now, knowing now he's, it myself. He's the biggest anti-Johnny critic. But, but, but he wasn't, he wasn't okay. in this particular instance, he wasn't right. criticizing Johnny Menzel because I am aware of that. But I just want to throw this out to you to see what makes sense. He talked about how they didn't run, they didn't require, rather, Johnny Manziel to stand in the pocket all afternoon long. There were no two-step, three-step drops or whatever. Now, he ended up throwing some long passes to Travis Benjamin, who had about three receptions for 115 yards and mm -hmm. two touchdowns. We know that. But at no time was Johnny Manziel required to do those things because they didn't believe that tailored to his game, nor mm -hmm. was he ready for it. Yep. Then they looked at their personnel and said, like you just said, what do we have? So we, when we look at it from that perspective, let me tell you what Johnny Manziel his teammates, not Johnny Manziel himself, because you know when we were at the finals, I saw Johnny Manziel yep. on a couple of occasions, yep. all right? And those conversations that he and I had, I'll leave to, to mm -hmm. us because he didn't ask me to divulge them. I'm certainly not going to violate his trust like that. But I will tell you what his teammates said, and they want it put out there. There's a difference between Brian Hoyer and Josh McCown. When you look at Brian Hoyer, he was that guy that wanted that job. Did y'all see that movie Draft Day? Yeah. with Kevin Costner, mm -hmm. and he came on this show and talked about it. And if you remember, there's a scene in there, and it's amazing, ironically, the franchise he was overseeing Cleveland. was Cleveland. <laughs> and he was talking about how they, the, the quarterback on the team was worried about Kevin Costner drafting another quarterback, mm -hmm. okay? So he and his wife and them, they were worried about it, et cetera, et cetera, and they ended up drafting somebody on the defensive side of the ball. Well, that was Brian Hoyer last year. Brian Hoyer didn't want Johnny Manziel drafted. He wanted the job to be all of his own. And when it didn't work out that way, he certainly wasn't willing to help him. Now, you and I don't have a problem with that because if you're competing for a job, it's no big deal. We understand it. That's what comes along with competitive fervor. So we get all of that. Josh McCown doesn't have that issue. And that's what those players wanted to point out. It's not a big deal that Josh McCown has been reinserted because Josh McCown is not trying to be the starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. He understands that this is something that's ultimately going to be handed to Johnny Manziel. And what the teammates were telling me was that, look at Johnny Manziel. He looks incredibly happy and relaxed. And it's not just because of his sobriety. It's not just mm -hmm. because he handled his yep. issues with alcohol by going, uh, you know, and getting some help in the offseason, which is well documented. It's because he knows that he has somebody playing the position with more experience who's willing to help him before gladly handing the baton to him. So when you take that into consideration and you combine that with the absence of weapons that he has at his disposal, I don't think there's anything wrong with Cleveland saying, we appreciate the job that you did last week, you know, in, in 8 for 15 for 172 yards with two touchdowns. We appreciate the fact that you didn't throw any interceptions. You didn't turn the ball over. We like all of that stuff. But there's still some things you have to learn. And plus, we're buying you time because we know what we're giving you to work with on the offensive side of the ball. Defensively, they had seven sacks. Defensively, well, I mean, what are you talking about? Brian Dansby, Hughes, I mean, Kruger, you got Whitner, all of these boys. That's seven sacks. These boys are balling defensively, and we know their defense is no, they're no scrubs. So if the defense is keeping you in the game, but you're limited offensively, and ultimately it could lead to diminishing your level of confidence, I think that the Cleveland, the Cleveland Browns may actually be doing something right on the offensive side of the ball for a change in terms of giving him some time to learn even more instead of throwing him to the wolves with the minimal amount of weapons he has. Okay, I, I hear that case. Where I disagree is with your conclusion that they're waiting to hand the baton to Johnny Manziel. I don't buy that. I don't think that Mike Pettin and Ray Farmer want that baton ever handed permanently to Johnny Manziel. They don't believe in Johnny well, well, Manziel. Well, you may be right about that, but what I'm saying is I clearly believe that they want him in there instead of McCown eventually. Now, even I'm just talking about for the purposes of this season. Obviously, if you could find somebody in the future you that think? you could go with, I definitely think they would. Listen, Johnny Manziel, miniature, 
likes to be a wild card, yeah. run with the football, sort of acts extemporaneously. You know, he's very impromptu in that regard. You may not want that if you are a head coach. So I certainly agree with Skip that from a long-term perspective, they're not that high on Johnny Manziel. But for the purposes of this season, I don't think they want somebody like McCown in there all 16 games. If Johnny Manziel develops to the point where they're able to insert him a few weeks into the season and allow him to be the starting quarterback for the team the rest of the way, you have to remember, at the very least, he's box office. At the very least, he's going to come, even though folks are going to watch football, he's going to fill the seats. You're going to want to, you're going to be interested in what he's doing. And if he's not going to hurt you any more than McCown will, why not take a chance on him for this season? Okay. I definitely believe now that's Now you've the case. made my final point. The only way Johnny gets back in the lineup for good for the rest of this season is if Patton crumbles under public pressure. Because clearly, the fans would much rather watch Johnny, even in a losing effort, than Josh McCown in a losing effort. So if they start to lose, which they almost certainly will, mm -hmm. then at some point, he's going to say, oh, gee, i got to distract the fans from this mess that we're making once again here. Maybe if I give them Johnny, they'll be happy for a little while, and they won't scream and boo us so loudly. So that, I could see that happening, but long term, I'm not buying it. Long term, I'm not buying it either, but I don't think it's just about public pressure. I think that as a coach, you kind of like, if you've got McCown as your option, you kind of like the thought of Johnny Manziel being out there. And it's, you just pray that he's effective. Yep. You don't want him to kill you, but if he's effective... He's clearly more entertaining to watch. And then when you see how the teammates, you know, galvanize around mm -hmm. him, mobilize around him, that's a tribute to Johnny as well. So I think that Patton and those boys would welcome that. The reason why it's hard to root against McCown is because McCown, from what I'm told, came in there from day one and was all about helping Johnny Manziel. I can't, I, I'm telling you, everyone there that I spoke to yep. raved about the relationship that McCown was able to cultivate with Johnny Manziel because he said, look, I've been here. He's a professional cultivator. That's what, what he saying. does. It's no, it's seriously, it's like, he goes to stop it's after it's stop and he like, cultivates. He's like, this is what... Well, seriously, I'm, he does. I'm totally... Well, I'm sure he great. loves that. But he's a cultivator. He's a good guy. He, he just sort of blends he's a, he's a good in. Whatever guy, you guys he's need. He's not a scrub. No, he's he not. Can, he can play a little mm -hmm. bit. And more importantly, you got to appreciate, how could you hate on a guy that understands what he is? and is willing to accept that to facilitate your growth. And, I mean, and by the way, down the stretch like in that? Chicago two years ago, boy, he was really good. Yeah. He's better than yeah. Jay Cutler, yeah. and you'd say that's not a lot. But last quick point. Yeah. My only last hope would be that the owner, Haslam, would blow out this coaching staff and maybe mm -hmm. the executive office and pick a coach, a la what happened with RG3 in Washington, Jay Gruden, pick a coach for Johnny that would drink that Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. gulp the Kool-Aid, right? Okay, it didn't work out so well for RG3, but we, I, I, I would love to see that happen for Johnny's sake. Gotcha. But again, what you guys mentioned earlier, if you're a Johnny supporter, really two ways to look at it. Blessing in disguise because of the supporting cast, or let the guy throw him into the fire. They're hosting the Raiders and keep the momentum going. Mm. We'll see. Hmm. On a more somber note, Yankees legend Yogi Berra passes at the age of 90. We'll look back on his storied life when we come back and pay our respects. That's next here on First Take.